Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to start in a few minutes. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to bring your attention to the slideshow of some beautiful images of the plein air Peconic artists. So you can enjoy that for just a few moments before we get started. Well, maybe we're just going to see one picture right now. It's a Susan's beautiful picture of her easel in the dunes capturing what you are seeing in nature on a canvas, which is kind of nice. We'll get the slideshow going. There we go. Love that damn pond. I haven't been over there in a while. Uh oh, stuck again. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that going. Nice, Catherine. Well, I think we could probably get started. Um, good evening and welcome to our series of conversations with our community. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking with three of the artists from Plein Air Peconic, and we thank you all for tuning in and special thanks to our panelists and moderator. Um, I'm Kathy Kennedy with the Peconic Land Trust. I hope you're doing well and staying safe and healthy. From all of us at the Trust, we wish you the best and are grateful that you're choosing to spend some time with us this evening. On a housekeeping note, uh, you are muted during this conversation, but at the end, we'll be answering questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to post a question and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. Um, a little bit on the Peconic Land Trust. As you may know, the trust was founded in 1983 with a mission to conserve Long Island's working farms, natural lands and heritage. And with your help, as well as the support of thousands of individuals, partner organizations, foundations, community groups, and really all levels of government, we've been able to accomplish a lot over the years. We've protected over 13,000 acres of land, including thousands of acres of natural lands. This includes wetlands, shorelines, meadows, woodlands, and forests that provide for respite, habitat for wildlife, and are especially important to uh, protecting our water for drinking, fishing, aquaculture, and recreation. Um, in addition, with your support, goodbye. In addition, we've helped conserve over 6,000 acres of farmland across Long Island that is available to farmers growing food and many other agricultural products. The term working farms is an important piece of our mission because we know that protection of farmland is really the first step beyond securing the beautiful landscape and vistas that they provide. We also help farmers be as productive and successful as possible on the land to provide local food to you and others in the community through affordable access to land, administering grants and programs that help them grow and offering educational programs to help maintain their high standards. All of this and more we're able to do every day because of supporters like you. Thank you. So today we'll be talking with a very talented and committed group of artists who have partnered with us for many years. They've com they communicate through art, painting and photography, uh, the value of conserved uh, landscapes here on Long Island. Their work is inspiring and it brings conservation to life for many who may not be able to see it in their daily lives. Over a dozen local artists have participated in Plein Air Peconic since the founding of the group in 2005, which started from a conversation between 
uh, painter Gordon Matheson and our uh, Rebecca Chapman from the Trust. So they've been capturing the iconic and not so familiar landscapes that represent the wide swath of con conservation work of the Trust. Um, the farm fields and the barns, the shorelines, meadows, wetlands, and dunescapes. Tonight, we're thrilled to have Casey Chalam Anderson, Susan D'Alessio, and Catherine Zoka join us, and to welcome a new moderator for our program, Annette Hinkle, arts editor for the Express News Group, including 27 East, the Sag Harbor Express, Southampton, and East Hampton Press. Annette Hinkle has been a writer, journalist, and editor on the East End for more than 20 years. A graduate of Ohio University, she's currently the arts and living editor of the Express News Group. Annette also produces and hosts 27 Speaks, which is a new weekly podcast with the editors of the Express News Group. Over the years, Annette has covered stories related to the area's cultural scene, including art, theater, literature, and history, as well as environmental issues and politics. And she's won numerous New York Press Association awards for her writing. She lives in East Hampton with her husband, Adam Flax, and occasionally their college age daughter, Sophie. Before I turn the program over to Annette, a final reminder on the Q&A. Please use the button at the bottom of the screen to pose a question to the panelists. We'll be turning to those questions at the end of our formal program. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Annette with our sincere thanks. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, thank you, Yvette, for managing what must be a very um, challenging back scene when you're doing a Zoom meeting. And it's so great to uh, be able to have Casey and Kathy I mean, Catherine and Susan here with us. And um, it's funny, I, this goes way back for me. I've been writing about plein air peconic since I think the beginning. So this is a real fun kind of trip down memory lane. It's been a while since I've, I've met up with, with, these, with these fine artists. So I thought it would be nice for our viewing audience if they could hear a little bit about uh, plein air peconic and how it came to be um, and about the art exhibitions that the group has had in um, conjunction with the Peconic Land Trust over the years. And Casey, I thought that might be a, a good question for you if you wouldn't mind taking the lead on this and giving us a little bit of the backstory about plein air peconic. For, I, I had counted 11 years, but I missed about four of them <laughs> only because I wasn't paying attention because I was there from the beginning. It was really Gordon who I had met at Elaine Benson Gallery when I was having a show there. That was a gallery that's not there anymore. Um, really famous place where that had shows all summer. Anyway, I met Gordon and he came back to me after that and said he had this idea to bring artists together that were, well, actually the show I was in there was a landscape show. So I was doing landscapes, but I wasn't doing plein air landscapes. I was working in my studio. And it was really Gordon, he had this idea that to bring artists together, the painters and the photographers, and that we could use our art to help to spread the word about land conservation. Well, painting outside, it, if you don't have the proper easel, which is the plein air easel, I'm sure many people have seen it, it opens up and then it folds up so that it looks like a little suitcase so you can actually travel with it. He convinced me that I should buy one of these. This is after me painting for many years on my own, but not outside. And after that, I fell in love with it. It's really exciting to paint outside. You can really only paint smaller pieces and I like to paint large. So usually what I'll do is just you know, paint a smaller piece and maybe translate it into something larger later. So Gordon's idea was that we would team up with Peconic Land Trust and we've, back, we've had so many numerous successful shows. And it really, the idea is that the artists really frames the view for people. And when you see a picture or a photograph, just any person, it, re it will crystallize that land for you or the water. And it always stays in your mind's eye. And it's when you see it in real life, you're going to, you're going to remember it. You can look at it with artist's eyes. So I feel like you, you were doing annual shows. Is that correct? Were they once a year or did you have shows multiple times a year? We had, I think, as many as three or four. 
because we did li traveling library shows. We had shows on the North Fork at um, uh, South Street Gallery, at Grenning Gallery in Sac Harbor. Uh, we were at East Hampton. In East Hampton at Terry Wallace Gallery. That, they, they were all a little different, these shows, and yet they were all, they really were great. It was fun. We also had many shows at Oshawa Hall. Mm -hmm. I think what's great is that I think too the artwork always revealed of you and you know even those that, of us that live out here and think that we know this place like the back of our hand oftentimes we see would see paintings and photographs in the plain air peconic shows and we would be like where where is that I've never I can't even imagine where that is which I think is a really interesting concept of, of you as artists being able to introduce a wider public to the, the spaces that we have out here. So I wondered if you, if, um, if the three of you could sort of jump in here and talk a little bit about the role that landscape art plays in the joint effort between you as artists and the Peconic Land Trust. Sure, I can jump in there. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I just also would like to dovetail with what Casey said regarding Plan Air Peconic. Uh, over the years, we've had a number of members and it's kind of a, it's an artist collaborative. And so in, in, in that kind of grouping and that community that was formed, we enabled each other to challenge ourselves to try to, you know, get to places where we might not want to get to and to try to envision them in ways, uh, in new and creative ways. So it's been a, a lot of fun over the years to see the different people's work. As right now, the sole photographer, it's interesting to be with a group of, of painters and it really informs my eye considerably to, to see how they frame a, a location with their, on, on their canvas. Um, but I guess the, the intersection between art and conservation is that, you know, the, the painting and the photograph really makes conservation visible. For the Land Trust, uh, I recall that when Gordon and Rebecca Chapman first started to talk, it was around a Through the Farms and Field benefit that kind of first started showing artwork. And it, they were struck by how much the, the people who supported the uh, Peconic Land Trust we're drawn to the artist's work. And we do make visible what people in the abstract may hear from the land trust about, uh, but until they actually see a painting or a photograph of the place as you kind of inferred in that, they really may not have a full understanding of the, the kind of uh, natural habitat that's in that space. So that's one of the things that we, we bring as ambassadors of the land trust. I think that's a good title, Ambassador. You should get your own residence out here. I think, that was, I think ambassadors was it. That, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and then most, I remember most of your, your shows were at Ashawa Hall. So that was like another really great place, I think, to hold your exhibitions because it's such a community-oriented space and just such a delightful place to go see art. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Ashawa Hall is, you know, it's, it's kind of... Uh, the, the, it has a lot of history to it, and so therefore it was just a natural spot for us to be. Also large walls allowing for the large canvases that, you know, Casey likes to uh, work with and some of the other painters. Although, you know, small is beautiful, so I think uh, beautiful paintings come in all sizes. That's great. So I thought for right now we would move on um, to maybe have each of you share some of your personal insights into the Peconic Land Trust properties that you've been particularly drawn to in your work. And I wondered if you could tell us where it is and why you like to paint or phot photograph it. So the first, uh, the first and thumb what we have is um, Casey's work of Dam Pond. So Casey, I think you can see which of your pieces up here. And if you wanted to speak a little bit about this location and your connection to it. Sure, Dam Pond is on the North Fork and it's on the way um, when you're going to the ferry is usually how I had seen it before I knew it was a conserved property. It's on the way to the ferry to New England. Mm -hmm. And what I think is so unique and special about this place and why I've painted it numerous times, I love how the sky opens up to be so big here. And of course it has a water element. I was always attracted to that thin line of lamb spit it looks very fragile and vulnerable, and it probably is. And I think that brings up the idea about how we ha can protect vulnerable pieces of land that are coming up against the water. And it, the land trust, you know, is also very tied to 
environmental concerns and trying to preserve beaches. But as you have, do, I say, do you have any idea how many times you've painted this view in the last 15 years? I think I did it a lot a while ago. I have, what really strikes me about this place is how many times I had just driven by and not n looked at it in this way, that way that I did when I painted it. And that's what I think an artist can bring to any person, which is when you see it literally framed on a canvas, then you start to see the landscape that way yourself. You start to see the clouds in a similar way. You start to look for those qualities that you saw framed and how the, how the clouds might be layered. This is looking north when you're going, well, whichever way you're going, it's on the north side of the road. And it's a road that's kind of, you're kind of going fast. So you have to look for it but you really are rewarded if you do. Yeah. And I feel like you'd have to be out there on a really, really nice day to paint there. Cause if it's well, a little bit, <laughs> if the wind's kicking up and the waves are getting a little rough, you may not want to be out there with your easel is, is probably my thinking. I think that Susan could talk, talk about that. How many times she's been caught in the rain. <laughs> yeah, that's a good topic. So okay. great. So it's go ahead. A challenge with the weather. Yeah. So we should, well, why don't we, with that, why don't we go ahead and move on to Susan's work? Um, we have, um, I think, images of Spring, uh, Springfield, Dam Pond, and Beach Lane, if um, Yvette is able to get your work up and you could speak okay. a little bit about those locations if um, okay. we get to that point. Well, the first image that Yvette is going to put up, I hope, <laughs> is, um, is a site that you can see from Montauk Highway in Amagansett. It was such a, when I was driving there, I noticed this as I was going by. It was such, it, it was such a, uh, a typical spring scene and had a lot of design elements I looked for in a scene. Great soft spring color, a composition with good foreground interest as well as middle ground and distance interest. Um, the property used to be the Amagansett Farmers Market and was gifted to Peconic Land Trust by Matt, Maggie D. Corveras. Um, and currently Amber Waves Farmers Market runs a farmers market which is not yet open as it was early spring when I painted this. Um, I think the distant view is of Quail Hill and the Deverellite pr property where I painted so many farming scenes over the years. So I, I had thought it was the Deverellite Preserve, but when I looked it up, it wasn't. So, um, but it's still like in that section where there's so much preserved by Peconic Land Trust that if I go there with with a thought to paint, I can find a farm scene or an orchard or a view. And it's nice to have a view shed where the public can see it from the road. So, and I think it's amazing that probably Route 27 and Busy Highway is right behind you when you're watching, right. looking at this view, which is amazing. Right? It's everywhere and that we're quickly- it's fun to paint there because it was early spring. There weren't that many people out and about. That's good. Good, good timing. Hey, I'd like to jump in. Also, Susan, I love the way you describe how the you know the, the foreground, the middle ground, and the and the background. I often talk with my photography students about how important it is to pay attention to you know when we paint a box of air or when we photograph a box of air, all of all of the information that's included within that. And you just did a great job of kind of explaining what is happening in your in your piece there. So thank you. I love that phrase, a box of air. That is what you're capturing, right? Yeah, right. So should we, sense, take, right? should we take, yeah, now this is also, this is Dam Pond as well, right, Susan? The same view that we it saw is. Casey had painted. No, I had, I had, the first time I painted Dam Pond was with Gordon and Aubrey Granger and myself, and we stood right on the highway there, and we painted the beautiful scene that Casey, that Casey um, had painted. But um, another time, 
years later. Um, anyway, standing on the highway with two other artists was easy because I was at that point, it was early in our development. And I was a little shy to stand out in the middle of nowhere and paint by myself. But as years went on, I enjoyed painting by myself the most because I can concentrate just on my painting. But anyway, this scene was, um, <clears throat> was something I spotted on my way home from painting another painting because it was getting late. And I just loved the reflections and the water was so calm. So I came back another day and painted um, a small sketch to make sure that the composition was working. Um, I forced the composition and I looked around and I found that I had a nice view from the back of um, the oyster pond um, historical society property, which was also preserved by the Conic Land Trust. So I had a good place to sit, set up by myself. And I just, um, let me see what else. This, this happens to be a pretty large piece that I painted in plain air, which is um, 24 by 36. Um, <clears throat> and I did go back um, maybe two or three times to capture the whole scene. When it gets to be a large painting, I do go back several times. I love the time of day that this one is. It's Yeah, so you, it's right you know. before, well, the sun would have been over to the left because that's where the sunset was. Mm -hmm. But it just, it's right before sunset. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's the golden hour. The golden hour. So, um, yeah, well, let's, well, if we move on, I love this painting as well. This, of course, is, Beach Lane and Wainscot, which um, anybody who goes down there with any regularity will recognize that house. I think it's called the Conklin House, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there's a there's a lovely little farm stand right off to the right there, which is I think our favorite farm stand um, with their strawberries and green farm stand. Yes. Yeah. What was the name of that one? Again? That well, the whole corner there is preserved land. Yes. Um, the Babinski farm stand. The Vinsky Farm um, and the corner next to the little white house, the Conklin House, is also preserved. And I've done about 10 or 12 paintings just on that corner. So, and so many other um, painters and photographers have captured the scene. Mm -hmm. um, but I must confess that I did not paint this one on location. <laughs> it was uh, painted for a photograph because I had stopped at the stop sign and and, and um, caught this woman on a bicycle on camera as I was like, and I just love the setup from it, the way it looks like it's, it was a summer scene, but I liked, I had originally painted it in the spring with the pinks and I, and I just love, and I think it's interesting that the Conic Land Trust um, preserves facades of buildings. An architectural um, facade preserve. So this particular um, uh, preserved spot was, is preserved. It's, it's, um, it's good that they, they preserve these iconic um, views of the Hamptons. And this yeah, that's, that's a classic for sure. Well, um, well, shall we move on? We can uh, move on to Catherine's um, work and, and see some of her um, her photographs of, um, we have, I think, Hendrickson's farm. Is yeah. Hmm? So we have, while the vet is getting that set up, I'll just uh, say for folks who are, are not familiar with my work as a photographer, uh, I consider myself a photographer of communities in transition. And over the years, I have, ha have had a number of essays that I've worked on. One is Vanishing Landscapes. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Uh, but basically capturing the agriculture and the barn landscape of the East End over the last several decades. Um, in addition to that, I just want to say that, you know, as a white photographer, I find that being out in the environment on the East End has been pretty easy for me to go and photograph properties. Um, even if I have to actually step on the properties, I have found over the years that people have been, you know, pretty generous and uh, not really um, un un 
unsure about me being in the landscape uh, with my camera, although more and more people come over and ask about it. This particular view, I would imagine people are familiar with it down on, um, gosh, it's, I guess, Lumber Lane. Uh, Richard Hendrickson, uh, if you didn't know who he was, he lived to, over, to be over 100. He was the weatherman for the East End. He was here in the 1938 hurricane. And he himself, I think if the Peconic Land Trust could have preserved him and kept him alive forever, they would have done it. He was really one of a kind. Yeah. And these are the, the fields and the, and the farm buildings that were on the property. Uh, and I just want to echo what Susan and Annette, you were talking about, about the light. I mean, photography as a word means drawing with light. And no matter what's changed around here, you know, nothing is more beautiful than the beautiful light we have at the end of the day falling on any landscape, whether it's, you know, a beautiful field like this or some rusty bit, you know, hidden within the field. So I just want to emphasize that, you know, what really makes for photographs, a compelling photograph often is the light. Uh, and now that I've said that, I would just also offer that I have brought in subjects that the other painters have not because they are favorites of mine, uh, photographing in the snow, uh, photographing in the fog. And this is a wonderful example of that. Over the years, photographing the landscapes with the title of the series called Vanishing Landscapes, uh, it became a little stressful for me actually having to see a lot of the beautiful farmscapes that I loved be developed. And so as a consequence, I decided back in I think 2004 or 2005 that I wanted to kind of, I wanted to focus on a landscape that had been preserved. And that was really one of my first introductions to the Peconic Land Trust. And that landscape was Quail Hill Farm. I went to Quail Hill Farm once a week over the course of an entire year and produced a series called Through the, Through the Seasons on Quail Hill Farm. And I do have to say that in a very short period of time working on the essay, it became clear to me that the story wasn't really the land, at least it wasn't the land alone. The story was really the people working the land. And so what I went into the project thinking I would be making you know, some arresting photographs of the land, of the vegetables, of the sky surrounding the land, I realized that it was a community that became the most compelling subject. The community of farmers and also the community of people who are members of the farm. And that I think is a powerful thing for all of us to realize that everything is connected and what the, one of the things the Land Trust has really grown to do very well is to connect people to the land so that it's not just, you know, the view shed, but it's actually using the land to its best purpose in my mind, which is agricultural usage, especially for the rich soils that we have on the property. So I'll say that about uh, this. And then this is, of course, an attempt, uh, or this is being involved with the, a group of painters, one strives as a photographer to come up with images that have a, a painterly quality to them. This is called Mystic Landscape. We have the fog in the distance. It, one of the beauties about Quail Hill, for those who have not been there, is that its topography is quite different than almost any place else on the East End because it has that hill. Most of what we, what we photograph and we paint is very flat, so we have these be beautiful broad horizons. Quail Hill is, is different, and so this, uh, in essence, I think uh, conveys the enveloping intimacy that Quail Hill offers to anybody who goes there. Yeah, I was wondering, I was going to ask you, Catherine, if the painters in your life had rubbed off on you as a photographer, and I guess the answer is kind of yes. Well, I guess I, I would absolutely say that. I would also say that over the years, a lot of painters have looked at my work and said, you know, I love how you've, I love your composition, and I'm, I want to paint that composition. So I think it's a two-way street, and I think that the goal always as an artist is to create a compelling image that someone wants to look at for longer than, you know, let's say 30 seconds, especially in our social media driven world today. Uh, and so by, do, and how do you do that? And you do that by creating an image that people may maybe haven't seen before. 
Um, and I think you've seen in all three of us that we have different styles, even though maybe we uh, painted or photographed the same location. And that's kind of the fun thing about being, being part of a collective. You know, we see how, you know, Casey and how Susan interprets a particular place uh, much differently than maybe I would. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, and I think while we're on that that note, I think we this is a good time now to talk a little bit more more about uh, vanishing landscapes, which was a term that you had coined several years ago about the way that things are changing out here. And I thought maybe um, Catherine, you and Susan could maybe address what you've witnessed as far as the scenery being altered since you began working in this area. And also if you could talk a bit about how then your artwork becomes a part of the historical record as a result. Sure. Susan, you want to jump in since you spoke? I can start. Um, that is going to put up. I don't know if we have a slide for this. Well, I guess we do. Yes, we do. Yes. We do. Yes. Which could be your um, hidden view. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the painting that is in view now. Um, this barn is in Wayne Scott off of Town Line Road. Um, years ago, in 2006, when I first painted this barn, it was a beautiful blooming potato field in front of it and a lovely yellow farmhouse next to it. Um, since then, when I painted it in 2013, I saw a hedge going up, the farmhouse torn down, and so the view shed from Townline Road was gone and all you would see was the hedge. So, oh, so um, at this point, um, what was I, I'm trying to get, okay. <laughs> anyway, so today the parcel is, is, the barn is still there, it's for sale and I think it's sold. So soon the barn will be gone and this beautiful view of our heritage is the farmland is gone. This was one property that got past, got away from the Conic Land Trust and they were not able to set, say not all properties can be saved. So now we have the big hedge there and that's pretty much what anyone will be able to see of this view that only a few years ago was there. Right, that's all, all you see is the big hedge and trees. Does that happen to a, as I'm saying, was that happened to you a lot in the, the places that you've painted, Susan? Have you seen them gone away like this? Oh yeah, yeah. A lot of places I notice there's development going on. So I go to them because I have access because people are building, so nobody's there. And you know, after hours I'll, I'll go or before early morning and I, I, and I can still see the view. Whereas once people are moved in, there's hedges up, fences up, and I can't, I, Wayne Scott in particular, some of the areas that I used to paint are no longer available. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot. It's, um, so in, in this case, I knew that things were going on with this and I did find access to the hidden view, but it wasn't the view that I had access to originally in 2006. Yeah. Well, that's a good time. Well, well, let's, we'll go and um, have Catherine now maybe talk a bit about, about a couple of your, and I know you have a lot of vanishing views because you've made a whole series of, of just that topic. So here's a good example that you had submitted. And I wondered if you could speak to this, um, this, these images on Lower Seven Palms Road a bit. Certainly. And just as a little contextualization, I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, quite a while ago, uh, I was doing some work for the group for the South Fork, which, who is now the group for the East End. And so I looked at the subdivision maps, and this is really going back to like the late 80s and early 90s, when Scuttlehole Road had very little development on it. And I was shocked to see that all the subdivision maps that had already been uh, put on the books on a lot of farmland that I thought would be would stay farmland, you know, sort of forever. So it was that awareness by looking at the subdivision maps, knowing that so many parcels had already been cut up and ready to go, that uh, drove the Vanishing Landscape series that I then worked on for quite some time. And in the early 2000s at the Southampton Historical Museum, I did a retrospective show and it included um, a dozen or more before and after shots of which, of which this is one on Lower Seven Ponds Road. 
uh, there used to be a row of trees, you know, on that street. And then, of course, the, uh, uh, the land was developed into a row of suburban homes. And so I just want to pause at the moment and give a real shout out to the land trust because, you know, it's really difficult in our, you know, very fragile, very small uh, geography on the east end of Long Island to be able to negotiate deals with owners in a way that will allow land to be not only preserved, but then to be used. And so I really, I don't know even a fraction of what goes on behind the scenes in terms of negotiating these deals, but I think we all do owe them, you know, a debt of gratitude for being able to preserve the wetlands, preserve the wildlife habitat, you know, preserve the farm fields. So I wanna say uh, that, and I also wanna just give a nod to the fact that we, we're all standing right now on an ancestral lands of the Shinnecock Nation. And this is something that I like to try to keep in mind when I go out, because it was theirs before it is ours. And we I think we should all sort of pay an homage to the fact that that is the case. So I think that what I like to try, how I like to try to frame it is that, you know, development is inevitable but what kind of development has to occur? And I guess the, the hope is that when you develop, you develop so that you have dense building around hubs of villages or hamlets, and you have agricultural spaces remaining undeveloped so that they can, the richest soils in America, for those of you who aren't aware of it, Bridgehampton does have the richest soils in America, so that that land can be used to, to farm. And uh, the land trust has tried to preserve as much as they can. When I drive through Sagaponic with those rich soils and see some of the huge mansions there, it's, it's, um, it's, hard, to, it's hard to convey with words the feeling that it that arises within me. So I will just leave it at that. Thank you. Well, and I think too, you know, as, this kind of leads into my the next topic, which is um, as artists, um, you are sort of like you said, the ambassadors of of land preservation and sort of pointing out what we could lose if the things that you think are going to be there forever. So I wondered if you could all speak to the idea of how you feel your work helps to further public awareness of the agricultural and rural spaces here on the East End, not only, you know, farms, but also the woodlands and the waterways and the nature trails and all that sort of thing. So I just wondered if you wanted to, to share some either anecdotes about people who've seen your work and learned or um, how you do feel that you're able to further the awareness of all these spaces out here. I'll and jump in and jump say, in. It, I, looking at Catherine's piece that she just showed the contrast with those suburban homes, that is very disheartening to see. And, and there are many, you know, we've talked about many examples of that. And that's why I think it's so important for artists, for us to keep putting these beautiful places in front of people's eyes because we're so inundated with news and social media now. It's really, I, I know I feel barraged by it. There's so much to think about. There's so much on the news, things to worry about. And it's easy to really close down and look away. In order to self-preserve, we almost have to close our eyes. But if we want to keep the land that we love, we have to see it. And so I think this is a really wonderful vehicle to bring that out more and more and to continue to do what we've, we've been doing. And it's been 15 years, so you've probably seen the fruits of your labor, so to speak, I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, I approach things very much as, a, as an artist. I'm not thinking about the political aspects as strongly. I feel like I, I care about that a lot. That's, that, that's why we have Plein Air Peconic. And we were, were loosely, we, we were a group, but we don't always paint together or photograph together. What the idea was, was that we would exhibit together because we wanted to bring this, I, this whole idea to the public. Yeah. Susan, do you want to weigh in on, on, on that a little bit about raising awareness of, um, of well, these beautiful spaces? I want to just say that when our artwork has been used in in many documents that Peconic Land Trust produces over the years, and as well as advertising in local newspapers um, for to bring attention, our photographs of our work, whether it's a photograph or a painting, 
um, the painting just says it all, or the photograph says it all, and it brings a different kind of attention, when it's artwork, it brings a different kind of attention to, to the story than a, just a, a news photograph, say, for example. So. Yeah, like pictures worth a thousand words. Those are a thousand words I don't have to write. I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> it's great. Hey, hey, Catherine, I wondered if you wanted to weigh in on that idea a bit. Well, we, we really don't want to take your job away, Annette. I hope you yeah, don't like, look at it that way. I could get unemployment like everybody else if I had to. <laughs> well, you know, I look at it this way. I mean, you know, we do what we can where we are with the talents that we are given and that we, we try to develop and to, and to nurture. Each of us in the group have different interests, obviously. And so for some people, they view a, a scene in one way, other people will view it in a different way. But there is, you know, art has the ability to transform hearts and minds in the way that, you know, a, any essay or any spoken word or article may, may not, and that I hope, well, you know, your writing is art too, okay. But, Art does have the, the ability to transform hearts and minds. And I think that in the case of looking at the paintings, uh, I would hope that the Land Trust has found that when they have shown people the beautiful work that the group has done, that they have gotten other people interested in their mission. You know, they have grown, you know, they have done, it, it has helped them as a friend raising people who really are attracted to the fact that they are looking to kind of be developers uh, outside, let's say, the purview of the town's, you know, development um, plan, or maybe in concert with the town's development plan, but basically trying to be their own ambassadors to saying to the towns, look, you wanted to have this kind of uh, farmland preserved, let's work together to make sure that that happens. Let's work together to protect, you know, the waterways or the wetlands so that we are very aware of the fragile environment that that we live on. So, so I wonder if that answers your question. So I think it does. I think it does. I mean, we've talked a little bit about um, helping the people, the community evolve as far as being aware of these spaces. But I thought that that maybe before um, we move on to seeing if there's any questions from the audience, that it would be nice to talk about personal evolution and not only your work personally, but in terms of issues surrounding land preservation on the East End. And, maybe how um, external events have been reflected or impacted um, your artwork or your approach to art. Um, and even, or even if it's just how you've grown as an artist internally, it doesn't have to be political. It can be um, a totally internal sort of growth. So I thought we would start with this beautiful painting by Susan of, um, of Harbor Sunrise. So Susan, do you wanna talk a little bit about your evolution as an artist in the years that you've worked out here? Um, okay, so this, the two paintings I, I chose for this section, this one, they're both from this year. Um, this one was a commission by a local golf course and they asked me to just present uh, something that I thought would go in their um, new dining room and sort of match their um, match but not match the paintings that already exist, existed there. They want a local scene and they approached me last December. So I, as a plein air artist, I was like, oh no. But then um, I used old photographs and old paintings and put together this triptych. Um, it was originally shown to them as a sunset view, at, but when I, they loved the composition but they didn't like the dark. So I went on and um, recreated it as a sun, sunrise view. I found old pictures of the boats that existed in, in that, um, that I've had over the years from Northwest Harbor. Um, the, uh, one, of, one of the boats is from Maine, I have to say. But anyway, what uh, my, this was a, a a chance for me to do a truly studio piece recreating from scratch. It was a whole different experience for me. I don't know if it was successful, but they liked it. So we're happy. But I love it too. I keep my boat, my husband and I keep our boat there as well. So we love this view. We know it well. It's, it's beautiful. a beautiful view. It's really beautiful. Um, so this, this um, the next painting 
is um, was done in June, and it was the first time I had really got gotten out for a long time, and plain, just plain air painted. I was able to. It just it just shows everything that I'm trying to produce a good composition, um, an atmospheric feeling. I. I could smell the roses. It was just a great painting day. And I was pleased with the result. Um, as for, I don't know how I can talk about um, how it helps preserve these spots, but they're just beautiful places. That's beautiful, you did a beautiful job on that. Well, we can move on. Let's move on to Casey. And um, Casey, this is your advancing surf. And um, I wondered if you wanted to talk about your evolution as an artist in relationship to these last two slides of yours that were shown. I always think about how this area is the way it is very much because we're very aware that the ocean is there. And even the fact that the farms, many farms go down to the ocean. And I don't, it, this would not be the same place without the ocean. It brings people here for water sports. It, we have fishing, there's so much. It wouldn't be, the, this place would not be the same. So, uh, and I'm fascinated with the waves and I've, I've, every time I've ever gone to the beach, I study them and I've been, I started making these, a series of paintings that are fairly large. They're six feet paintings. So obviously they're not plein air. I do them in my studio. I really love painting big because I feel like it's, somewhat of a dance. It's very physical. I will definitely spend time on the beach and do sketches and do photographs, often drawings until I find something specific, that moment when the wave is crashing down. And I think about how vulnerable we are in the face of the ocean, especially with regard to erosion and all the serious problems that we have uh, because we live by the water. And then that's, and, yeah, it's true. And yeah, here's another one of your um, great paintings. This is Wide Clean Wave. Um, and again, it really does show the power of the ocean, doesn't it? Well, I think I, it's very hard. I do do smaller paintings of, the, of waves and you can get that intimate view. The reason I love doing it big is that your peripheral vision, if you're standing in front of a painting that's six feet wide, your per peripheral vision is filled up and you get that, Im the impact is just stronger. Yeah. And I, I like the act of wrestling with the painting, which can sometimes happen if you're out plein air painting as well because of the bugs and the sun and, and then the wind catches it. <laughs> all the equipment. Uh, there's something fantastic about going out there into the field and I'm really glad to do that on a regular basis because I think it keeps my eyes sharp and it keeps it's also a very physical endeavor. That's, def that's definitely a way that you've changed as far as an artist you, you get out of the studio and do some of your work outside which is definitely a challenge I would say. Um, so Catherine, shall we move on to, uh, to yours? This, this is um, your, your photograph procession. So I wondered if you want to talk about evolution in terms of these last two photos of yours. Sure, I, just as a, a nod to what Casey was just saying about the ocean, I mean, the ocean is the reason we have the great light that we have out here. I mean, the, the ocean creates the atmosphere, the, the ocean reflects the light off the surface of the water, and it makes the light out here different than it would be were we not in this kind of a beach uh, community. And then regarding, you know, the challenge of the painter's plein air, uh, I'll just say this morning, as I mentioned earlier, I was up in Lazy Point with all the mosquitoes and the ticks. Um, you know, it's not really, uh, it's not a picnic uh, for those people who think, oh, I'll go out with my easel and I'll make a painting, you know, and everything will be beautiful. Uh, no, it's, there's a lot of elements that you have to contend with. And the painters do it more so than the photographers, although we do spend a lot of time in the landscape really trying to figure out what is the right angle, what is the right way to approach this, when will that cloud move so that the sun will come out, you know, so there's lots of things that, you know, the photographers do, do need to deal with. But my own evolution over time has included a number of different um, series. As I said, 
I, I consider myself a photographer of communities in transition. One of those series would include documenting the African-American community in Bridgehampton with a photo essay called Life Along the Turnpike. That was a longitudinal study that I did for several years of the families that live in that wonderful community that is part of Bridgehampton's heritage. Uh, in addition to that, I also have been working on a COVID series where everybody was is in, you know, in their own home. Uh, but this particular image comes from a series called Witness. And this photographic series uses landscape imagery as a commentary on contemporary culture. And it realizes my longstanding goal to create a compelling photographic essay that captures my concern about community, environment, and society. So over the years, as I've kind of focused on those communities in transition, I struggled to find like an aesthetically powerful way that, would, that could express this deep concern about both the luxury development of our rich farmlands and our wildlife habitat, along with the growing inequalities that exist and are, and are becoming more exacerbated on the East End. So the practice of wrapping trees in winter, for me, symbolized both the loss of our agrarian heritage and the growing disparity of wealth. Uh, I found the wrapped images very rich in metaphor. Now I'll say I recognize the beauty of the forms and I acknowledge the skill of the landscapers who sculpted them. It's not a commentary on their efforts, uh, but I do think that it is the beauty that makes the essay, essay more compelling. The wrapped trees are symbols for, can be symbols for many things. Social inequality, as I mentioned, isolating technologies, we're all on our cell phones, uh, racial tensions, our narcissistic society with everyone wrapped in themselves, not to mention refugees, people on the margins, uh, and minorities. So through this essay, of which there's many images, I hope that people would pause and reflect on the threats that our community, environment, and society faces. And so that really, in a very short few sentences kind of contextualizes what this is is about. Yeah, I think it's fascinating because it, it, you're really looking at plant material, but you're not looking at plant material. Which is well, I'll just say, I'm sorry to uh, um, step in there, but this was in the, uh, the Guildhall member show for which it, it uh, received an award. And many people thought that I had actually staged people in there and wrapped them. So you, you're not far uh, away from that. Yeah, well, that, you definitely I think, found the image to set it all. Um, so let's, we'll go on and, and, and we'll have you um, end with your Wilson's Grove um, photographs, which are amazing. Um, and again, if you want to talk about evolution and, and where you are with this triptych, it would be great to hear your thoughts. So last, um, I guess last summer, all of us participated in a wonderful benefit of the land trust at the Wisnowski's uh, barn, which is just a wonderful treasure for the East End. And we were, um, we were tasked to make a very large image because the barn is very large and you need large images in order to be able to have them read from within the barn. So this trip, so I decided to do a triptych and to do it with a different technique than a straight photograph. So again, it was the the relationship with uh, Planner Peconic to the land trust that challenged me to try to come up with a way photographically to create a, a, a very large image and then also to have it blend with the other paintings because at this point now I'm the only photo photographer and I thought it would be nice to have the photograph not necessarily scream out photograph, you know, when people walked into the barn. So I came up with using a different technique made the triptych and framed it. And that is uh, Spring Evening Light uh, in Wilson's Grove. That's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. So um, do we have some, I guess we have some questions that we want to get to, is that right? Um, um, yeah. Okay. I, oh, oh. There's a vet. I'm back. <laughs> Yes, I didn't want everybody to see me struggling with the uh, with the tech. Um, yeah, there was one question. Uh, Larry uh, asked the question whether or not each of the artists could state where their work could be viewed currently. Um, so I don't know if you want to go. It's a hard question since nobody's going anywhere right now. <laughs> or websites. Certainly online, right. 
Yeah, no, we should put, we should, our websites for sure. I did have a, a driveway show twice. <laughs> Not not official. Actually, we an official one, but I, some people had come and I actually made two sales in my driveway. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> they were people who already knew my work, so they, you Great. know. Yeah, I guess that that's the question: is when are we going to be able to to go to galleries again? They're supposed to be open now. Do you right? I, well, there are some that are doing shows. Um, I don't know if they're limiting how many people can come in and so, yeah. how many artists can show, but it may be. It's hard to want to do that. Yeah, no, I get it. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll also say that as co-owner of Canio's Books, I have photographs at the bookstore. For those of you who don't know that I am also wearing that hat as well, um, you're welcome to come to the bookshop and uh, there's some there and we can, we can talk. Also, my website I just put in the, um, in the chat in the chat so we might have i also i also have a few um paintings on with the salmon gundy club in new york city on artsy posted but if you go on my website then it'll show you how to do that anyway so kathy maybe do you think that the peconic land trust could put the artists um websites up on the on on your up on your page maybe Absolutely. Yeah, we can definitely put the websites up so everybody will be able to access the information. Sure. So, uh, um, yeah, I'll just jump in on one thing quickly. You can go, if you go on the Peconic Land Trust website and look under Plein Air Peconic, I'm pretty sure um, there's a page on the website for Plein Air Peconic and then each of the artists, there's usually a link to their site. So if it's not completely fully up, it will be by tomorrow morning, I'll make sure. But, um, and then people can access uh, the work for not only Casey, Catherine, and Susan, but also the other artists who've yeah. been participating. It looks like we have Darrell Godfrey with us. She said, this is so cool. It's like a party with pals. <laughs> and it really is like a party with pals, so. Hi, Darrell. <laughs> Hi, Darrell. Darrell has photographed me so many times. <laughs> and I love those photos she takes. Yeah, it's great. And uh, Sue is weighing in saying um, Henderson was fab. I guess she's referring to Richard Hendri Hendrickson. Is that what she, she means by Henderson? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Good. Yeah. So um, I think that's right now. Uh, and Casey, did you want to chime in? Or maybe that way. Um, that uh, looks like. I, will say, I wanted to also, I mean, thank you, Yvette, and, and thank Kathy for all your work over the years. Kathy was the point, it, and is the point person for getting us on property that we, you know, when it was private property, teaching us about new conserved areas each year that we might be able to go paint on, and just being the liaison between the land and the artists many times. And, um, but, you know, in looking back over, you know, to do this panel, it's, I can't believe it's been so long that we've been working together. It's a little shocking, but it's a wonderful thing. And I'm, I, I think I learned a lot about land. I, I was a painter before I moved here, but I came from New York City and I had to learn being in the land, being on the land, learning about land, that was alien to me and probably still is a little bit. But being able to go out there and paint, it's for me, it's almost, it's my version of a hike, you know, to get to know the, get to know not just the view, but actually be standing on the ground. So oh, I'd like to just want to chime in a little bit too, just to acknowledge the work that we've all done together over the years. Um, I mean, I really feel like the, the art has shed, you know, light on, so to speak, um, a lot of hidden locations and also made people aware that maybe what they drive by every day, they don't even realize is conserved land that the land trust has been involved in. And then they see a painting of it and they, they think, I know this place, this is the farm, you know, in Bridgehampton or whatever. So um, I think that it's great that we have the partnership. I think that um, all of the artists that have participated all this time have made a huge impact on the community, the public in general. And we love having the work 
up in various locations. We actually have some of the works at our office in Southampton, um, also at Bridge Gardens in Bridgehampton, so you can see them there. Um, it's just beautiful and we're thrilled to have the partnership with you. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to echo that and to thank Yvette and, and Kathy, but also to say that, you know, the land trust is involved in a lot of properties and in this moment of COVID, there's a lot of wonderful trails that they have on their website. You can go to the website, you can look at locations that you can hike and you can go and you can feel, you know, safe uh, with your family or with, you know, your friends, as long as you're masked and socially distancing. But there's a lot out there, a lot of resources to appreciate. And a shout out to the work that they do for the food that they grow, that they then give to the pantries. I mean, there, so there's a lot happening. It, there, there's a complex web of community that's developed over the last 30 years. You know, it's kind of like the root system of a tree. And it's really underground, like you go to the redwood forest and you look up and you see the canopy and the, and the, and the majesty not realizing that underground, under the ground, all the trees are interconnected. And that's kind of like the way I, I, I feel, you know, the land trust has grown in that interconnectivity and we as artists have, are, are part of that network and, and that you as a writer, part of that network. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's wonderful to see and to be, and to be a part of, thank you. Yes, it's You're very perfect. The Conic Land Trust has made me grow as an artist from the day we started working with them I just kept painting because I had a, a place and a reason to paint. And it's been 15 years. And I think I've grown over the 15 years. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> the kind of Thanks, Yvette. <laughs> yes, thank to you all. And, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. That was, that was fun. Yeah. yeah, it was great fun. Thanks, Annette. Thank you so much. You were great. Thanks. That, that sense of community that I don't think you don't find everywhere and it, it, it is all interconnected and I think we continue to do whatever we can to have the opportunity to actually take an action locally makes it so much more real. Great. Yep. Yeah. And with that, this was a Thank wonderful, you. wonderful opportunity to see all of you, even if only on the video screen. Hey. If one day again, we'll be, hey. we'll be meeting up at a reception. At Let's Ash go Omaha. to the beach and have a drink. I'm going right now if anybody wants to join me. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> be on the left to the right side. So. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Have a good thank night, everybody. And thank the audience. Thank you all. Thank you, audience, for joining thank us. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Casey, Catherine, Susan. That was amazing. I was fascinated by every moment of it. And we really appreciate the time that you've, you've uh, you know, shared with us and your work over the years. And um, Net, you are a brilliant moderator. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and guys, stay and everybody stay tuned because we're going to do another pro uh, another Zoom program on July 23rd, where we're focusing on horticultural innovators. And um, so we're very excited. So if you haven't registered already, join us on the 23rd. And with that, I wish everybody a good night and stay healthy, safe and sound. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Great. Thank all you. Right. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night.